الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So today inshallah ta'ala we are going to do uh, two of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam both of them with somewhat similar backgrounds but very different stories and both of them are, are Christian leaders of Arabian Peninsula both of them are Christian um, kings when we say kings they're not quite kings the way we understand kings. They're more like chieftains, but they they had a status or a rank that was between the king and between the chieftain. And we're going to start with the more famous of the two, and that is Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i. Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i. Adi ibn Hatim, uh, we don't have too many details, but what we do is a very interesting story, and also we have some hadith narrated by him, and then we'll move on to the second story as well. Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i, his main fame actually comes from his father. His father was far more famous than him. And his father was none other than the famous Hatim al-Ta'i. Hatim al-Ta'i, every single Arab has heard of Hatim al-Ta'i. To this day, after 1,500 years, people are still aware of who Hatim al-Ta'i is. And that's the father, not the son. And the father, Hatim, was a chieftain of the tribe of al-Ta'i. And al-Ta'i is... Uh, in the modern city of Ha'il. Ha'il is a city in Saudi Arabia and Arabia, which is in northern Arabia. It's also one of the most beautiful, one of the most green areas of the kingdom. And Hatim al-Ta'i, what was he known for? Or Araz, what was he known for? Karam. Hatim al-Ta'i, his name is associated with generosity. Akram min Hatim is like they would say, uh, so what they say, Yudrabu bihil mathal. He is the person uh, who sets the standards for generosity. Everybody has heard of the fame of Hatim when it comes to generosity and taking care of uh, guests. Hatim's mother, by the way, uh, it seems like uh, he her learned generosity from her. His mother was, ext his mother was extremely generous and uh, she would give so much wealth that in fact her brothers uh, denied her of her inheritance so that she could no longer give any money uh, to anybody. So it seems as if he learned uh, generosity from her and Hatim al-Ta'i he was not only generous he was the chieftain of his people and he was also a poet in other words he was the man in pre-Arabia he was everything that people wanted people to be he was generous he was kind he was noble he was a chieftain and he was a poet and uh, he and his people uh, they followed uh, a sect of Christianity uh, which in Arabic is called Rakusiya and I looked this up where the origin is and I could not find the origin of the term Rakusiya. Uh, but it appears to me, and Allah knows best, it appears to me that this is essentially Orthodox uh, Christianity, Rakusiya, Orthodox Christianity. Because the type of Christianity that they followed uh, is now called Syrian or Syriac Orthodox. And it is also called the Jacobites, also called the Mon Monophysites, etc., etc. Um, no need to get into all of that Christian uh, um, uh, issues. But just FYI, you should know the Christianity that the northern Arabs followed was not the Christianity of Rome. It was not the Christianity that we now call uh, Catholic Christianity because it was Roman Christianity that became Catholic Christianity. The Arabs followed another version which is now Orthodox Christianity or is called Syriac Orthodoxy, Coptic Orthodox, um, Nestorianism. There are different versions that they follow. Back to our story. So Hat Hatim, as we said, was this chieftain uh, of the people of Tay. He had a massive house. And by the way, very interestingly enough, his house still remains. It is a tourist site to this day. It's a palace. You can still see the remnants of the palace. And it is well known that he would feed any stranger that comes with the most uh, luxurious and the most exotic, um, uh, whatever he had, he would give. And many stories are narr narrated about the father, uh, meaning Hatim. Uh, once it is narrated that a group came to him and uh, he told his servants to sacrifice the camel. And his servants whispered to him, we are out of camels, you fed the last one to the guests yesterday. So he said, do you not have my steed, my horse outside? And they said, yes. He said, sacrifice that. They said, but that is your prized horse. It is faster than any animal. And he said, sacrifice that. Now, it's halal to eat horses, but this is pre-Islam anyway. And the Arabs ate horses, and they also considered it to be uh, a permissible meat. And Islamically, horses are also halal to eat. Anyway, the point is, he sacrificed his horse to feed his, um, his guests. And um, again, there's many, many stories. Once it is narrated that a Bedouin passed by the house of Hatim after he had died. He saw one of the daughters of Hatim dressed shabbily. One of the young girls dressed very shabbily. And he said... You are the daughter of Hatim and you're dressed like this. 
And she replied, the karam of Hatim has left us like this. Means he left with all that wealth, he gave it all away, and we have nothing left. And of course, uh, karam, I've given khutbahs about this, it's well known in Islamic um, uh, hadith and Quran, that the blessings of karam are a whole different topic. Uh, just interestingly enough, the word for nobility is the same as the word for generosity in Arabic. Karam means both noble and generous. They're both the exact same word. And of course, Allah himself, his name is Al-Kareem. And the angels are Kiram and Katibin, And they're Mukrameen. And Allah Azza wa Jal Karamna Bani Adam. He has honored the children of Adam. And Allah Azza wa Jal loves the Kareem. Our Prophet ﷺ said, the Kareem is beloved to Allah and the beloved to the people. And the one who's stingy is despised by Allah and despised by the people. And we even see this in our lives as well. Those who are generous to others, Allah Azza wa Jal gives them more. And in generally speaking, the ones who are the most generous are the ones that live the best as well. They keep on giving, they keep on getting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as well, they are the most beloved amongst the people. The ones who give the most are the ones who are the most beloved as well. So this is Hatim al tai He died before hearing about Islam. So he died in his faith tradition. He died before uh, hearing of Islam. He died 608 or so, 6, uh, 605. But he didn't hear of Islam because he's living up north and it was before the time that Islam, uh, the Medinan phase did not reach him. Uh, whether he heard about the Prophet in Mecca or not, we do not know. But he died before the coming, uh, not before the coming of Islam. He was alive when the Prophet was preaching in Mecca. But there's no knowledge of him having heard of Islam up north because uh, the Medinan phase had not begun when he died. He died in the Meccan phase. So Allah Azza wa Jal knows best um, uh, about that. Adi was raised in this environment. And Adi is the son of a king, therefore, the son of a chieftain. And as Islam began to spread in the Medinan phase, slowly but surely, tribes were being conquered and tribes were embracing Islam. And Adi's area, which is the modern city and the modern state of Ha'il, Ha'il is a province up north, above Medina. So above Medina, you have Yamama, you have Najd, you have Ha'il. These are all in the north of Medina. Down, keep on going and you'll get to Tabuk. Keep on going, then you get to Syria. All of these are provinces of Arabia. Ha'il is where uh, Adi ibn Hatim was, the, the province of Tay, uh, where the Tay tribe was, is Ha'il. One by one, these provinces are either embracing Islam or being conquered by the Prophet So Adi is told, you had better do something. Adi is told by his people that either negotiate with him or embrace the faith. And Adi said, I am happy in my deen and I have no need of another deen. I'm happy being a Christian. I don't need any other faith. And he, of course, there's a sense of arrogance towards the pagans as well who are embracing Islam. He felt he's better than them. And of course, as a Christian, he was better than them. And he felt he's, there's no need to follow another religion, much less politically surrender his authority to a person in Medina. However, he began to be worried about his power as one province after another is conquered. And eventually he started to take, take some precautions. He told his shepherds, he told his, uh, his people that keep track of the armies of Muhammad And if they come close to our land, tell me. And he had prepared a bunch of camels with his wealth, with food, with drink. In case he needed to flee, he could take those camels and uh, flee. One day, a shepherd came rushing to him and said, you keep on asking us if the army of Muhammad comes close. What if it were to come? What would you do? He said, you see those camels there? I would jump on them and flee. So his shepherd said, then you'd better do what you just said you'd do. Meaning, it's time. They're coming. You better do what you said you're going to do. So Adi took his wife and children and he simply abandoned everything and he fled to the land of Syria uh, where of course he was surrounded by fellow Christians. However, Adi said, I felt even more miserable in Syria than I had basically waiting for the attack in uh, my land because obviously he in Syria, he might be a fellow Christian but he is an Arab and they are they are Greeks and Romans. And culturally and linguistically, everything is different. He felt like a stranger because he was a uh, stranger. So he was not happy in Syria. Around the same time where this is happening, another incident happens with, with Adi's family. And that is that a group of the people of the tribe of Tay are captured and brought to Medina. Perhaps in the same battle that had taken place, perhaps it had found elsewhere, we don't know. 
in one of them was the daughter of uh, Hatim, meaning the sister of uh, Adi. Okay, her name was uh, Safana. Her name was Safana. In one version, it says it is the aunt of Adi ibn Hatim, so the sister of Hatim. So either the the this um, either the sister of Adi or the aunt of Adi, one of the two. Okay, in the version of Muslim Imam Ahmad says the aunt, in the version of Ibn Ishaq says the sister. In any case, one of the women of the household, a, a direct relative, is captured, and she is taken to Medina. Now, Hatim al tai is the most famous Arab pre-Islam. There is no one that is more famous than him. And as I said, one of the main indications of his fame is that to this day, every Arab without exception that, that has been raised in Arab lands and has gone through any Arab education system knows Hatim al -Tai. He's one of those who's to this day, 1,500 years later, his name remains legendary. That's very rare for somebody's fame. So imagine if this is the case now, how about back then, right in his lifetime and after his death? So Hatim al -Tai is somebody who is the legendary Arab uh, of the time. So anybody related to him obviously is royalty. So this lady, Saf, uh, Safana, Safana, she stands up from amongst the prisoners and she speaks boldly to the Prophet ﷺ. The books of history say she was a bold lady and she did not mince her word. She did not bite her tongue. In those days, ladies were generally reserved and shy. Uh, the daughter of Hatim al tai is not like that. The daughter of Hatim al tai is very, very bold and she has no problem you know, asserting who she is. And she introduced herself and she said, Oh Muhammad, she's not a Muslim at the time. Oh Muhammad, give me my freedom. Like she just demanded it like that. I am the daughter of Hatim al tai Give me my freedom. Umnun alayya. So the Prophet ﷺ seemed to be somewhat irritated and said that Adi ibn Hatim is the one who fled away from Allah and his messenger because the news spread that when the armies came, Adi fled and took his stuff and ran away. That's a very cowardly thing to do and it's very undignified and it's also something that he's running away from Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ is, is not happy at what Adi has done. So if even if your sister, he is the one who fled away from Allah and his messenger and he did not give her her request. The next day, the same thing. She stood up and she asked the Prophet ﷺ for her freedom. And he said the same thing. The third day again, she asked. So she's very assertive. And at this time, the Prophet ﷺ then said, go and free her. So he allowed for her to be freed. Uh, then it is said that Ali ibn Abi Talib was close by. So Ali whispered to her that, ask the Prophet ﷺ to give you a camel. So even Ali wants her to be saved. Ali wants her to get back to her brother. And of course, the reason being that everybody wants her brother to convert. So she asked the Prophet ﷺ for a camel to go home. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, until you find safe passage. I can't just give you a camel and you wander in the middle of the desert like this. He wanted to protect the honor even of a non-Muslim lady. He wanted to protect her. The reason, of course, is because it's dangerous for a lady to be wandering around. Even if it's just, it's, she's not a Muslim, she's safer in Medina. Nothing's going to happen to her in Medina. You're protected here until you find a safe passage, safe caravan, then I'll let you go. So she waited for a few weeks until finally a caravan either from her tribe or a neighboring tribe buying and selling goes to Medina and she negotiates with them. It is said she recognized somebody and so they promised her safe passes. So she then demanded her camel and the Prophet ﷺ gave her the camel to go and she returned to her people only to discover that Adi had fled up north. Adi ibn Hatim had fled up north. So she followed him and she went to Adi up in Syria uh, to find her brother. And she then rebuked him a severe rebuking that you have embarrassed us, you have ashamed us, your father would never have done this. He's the leader. He couldn't have just fled like this. He couldn't either negotiate or surrender or do something that a leader should do. How could you have done this? So she's fuming in anger at him. And then she says that, and I was with Muhammad وسلم, and I saw him to be a noble man. She's not a Muslim yet. She, by, by the way, she eventually embraces Islam. Right now, she's not a Muslim. If he is truthful, then you are honored to follow him. And even if he is not truthful, you will not be a loser being with him. 
In other words, her assessment of the Prophet ﷺ is that if he's truthful, alhamdulillah, great. Even if he's not truthful, he's not a prophet in her eyes, he's a great leader. That's what she's saying. Okay? Even if he's not truthful, you're not a loser being with him. You're still going to gain honor uh, uh, to be with him. So when her, his own sister is now telling him that he needs to go and see who the Prophet ﷺ is, then... He decided to make his way down. He was already miserable in, in, in Syria anyway. So he decided to go and see who the Prophet ﷺ was. But he did not want to convert. He wanted to just try to negotiate something. And also in this time, uh, when Adi had been mentioned and somebody got angry uh, by mentioning the name of Adi in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ said, rather I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring him to me and that he shall put his hand in my hand. So the Prophet ﷺ was hopeful that Adi will come to Medina and that Adi will embrace Islam even though he had fled away and done a very undignified thing for the son of Hatim al-Ta'i to do this is very, very uh, unbecoming of the son of Hatim al-Ta'i to act in such a, uh, a cowardly um, fashion uh, just to take care of himself and his family and flee away like this. It wasn't something that was becoming. Nonetheless, he remains the son of Hatim al-Ta'i and he is well beloved and respected by his people despite all that has happened. So Adi comes all the way down to Medina and as he enters the city, people recognize him. And this shows you how famous he was in the pre-internet era. Who knew what anybody looked like? Huh? Yet when Adi entered Medina, people began chanting, It is Adi! It is Adi ibn Hatim! And the halls, not the halls, the, the bazaars and the marketplace began, people began pointing, that's Adi ibn Hatim. Imagine that's how famous his Adi was. And Adi had done nothing other than be the son of his father, subhanAllah. Just think about that. His claim to fame is who his father is. That's it. That's all. Like what a legend that man must have been that Adi is now just because of his father that um, famous. So he came to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and subhanAllah exactly like the dua of the Prophet He walked straight into the masjid and he recognized the man sitting in the middle must be the Prophet Sallallahu He didn't have seen him before and he put his hand out to shake it like the people do. Obviously, it is not becoming of a Muslim to do this because there's more respect given but Adi is not a Muslim yet. So he just walks in, barges in, just walks straight into the middle and he puts his hand and what did the Prophet say? I wish that he puts his hand in my hand. Right? And this is exactly what happened. So the Prophet ﷺ put his hand up to greet him, but he said, Man, yani who is this? Because he's not, he's in the message, he's not hearing the people outside. So Adi says, I am Adi ibn Hatim. I am Adi ibn Hatim. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, uh, he did express the same expression he gave to his sister, Al Farru min Allahi wa Rasuli, the same Adi that ran away from Allah and his messenger. So there's a little bit of reprimand, like the same one who did that, and then there was silence. Then the Prophet wasallam stood up and grabbed him by the hand and walked him to his own house. And this is an honor that is rarely given in the seerah. Rarely given. In fact, you would be hard-pressed to find similar. Very few times this has happened. That the Prophet wasallam essentially stops everything he's doing. Whatever was going on, which we don't know no, right now, whatever was going on, all the Sahaba surrounding him, he stops everything. He holds Adi by the hand and he takes him to his own house to honor Adi ibn Hatim. And again, all of this shows us the, the, the respect that should be given to important people. And I've said this many times in the seerah, you know this from me. Some Muslims have a very, very naive understanding of reality and of the seerah. And they say, oh, everybody is exactly equal. Well, everybody is equal in one sense. Nobody's saying they're not. But common, and by the way, the people who say this, they themselves don't treat everybody equally. They themselves, if a very, very important dignitary came, they themselves would bend over backwards and be extra charitable. That's common sense. Nothing un-Islamic about this. But the only thing is in Islam, when such a person comes, you treat him with the extra treatment, not because of his status, but because of what Islam might gain by that status. Not because of your ego, but because the religion might benefit because of that person's uh, background and 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 stand. and this is something that is well known throughout the seerah uh, and of course there is even a hadith uh, جاءكم, this is a hadith uh, when the 
nobleman of a group comes to you, then you show him nobility and honor. إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ أَوْ إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ كَرِيمُ قَوْمٍ فَأَكْرِمُوا when the kareem, when the dignitary of a person comes to you, then show him respect. And also when Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh came, uh, when, the, um, uh, when, the tr when the judgment was going to be given uh, for after the battle of uh, uh, the Ahzab, and he came on, on, uh, on his animal and he was wounded, the Prophet ﷺ said to the Ansar, قُومُوا إِلَى سَيِّدِكُمْ Stand up to greet your leader. Don't just sit here when he's coming. So he told the Ansar to stand up to greet your leader. This is not the way you're supposed to be when your own leader is coming. Uh, and all of these incidents and, and evidences show that, of course, of course, when a person who is given respect in his community uh, comes to our community, we give him a similar amount of respect. It's something that goes with the territory. Unfortunately, again, many of our Muslims, they really don't understand these basic facts and, and, and they take offense uh, at these types of things. And there are many, many evidences from the seerah for this regard. Nonetheless, so here the Prophet ﷺ stood up, took Adi by the hand and walked him to his own house. On the way, as he's walking to the house, a frail old lady hobbled up she didn't recognize Adi, couldn't care about Adi. She saw the process and said, Ya Rasulullah, inni laka haja. I have a need I need to talk to you about. So he let go of Adi's hand and he walked to the old lady and Adi stood there in shock. That how could, now because he felt honor, the leader's leader and, and, and I'm the leader, he's the leader, we're being honored. Now some unknown frail old lady, you can tell by her dress, she's not a VIP, you can tell by her demeanor, she's not somebody, but... And she's just asking whatever her need might be. And the Prophet stood there patiently listening to her for a while. She, Atada, she, she took a while to whatever, we have no idea what it was, whatever her question, whatever her issue. And then when it, when it was done, he returned back to Adi. And Adi said, Wallahi, this is not, he said to himself, this is not the characteristic of a king. This is the characteristic of a prophet. This is not how kings act. That when an old lady comes, they don't just stop their meeting with another VIP and then do that. So this also shows us, yes indeed, we honor dignitaries, but not at the expense of disrespecting other people. Yes, we go out of our way to show extra respect to those who deserve it. But in that extra respect, we do not disrespect anyone who deserves our respect. And in fact, in one version of this incident, by the time they got to the Prophet's house, three people had stopped him one after the other. And this is understood because the Prophet is the center of attention. Everybody's coming to him for every need that they have. And they're asking the Prophet for different things. Somebody's asking for food and money. Others are asking for making dua because there's a lot of highway robbery, etc., etc. And these are all things that Adi is shocked to hear because he's not even yet a Muslim and yet he's hearing about all of these uh, instances. They arrive at the house of the Prophet and Adi is shocked to see a bare room, one small room, no palace, no nothing, no grandiose. And... Not even furniture to sit on. Nothing for him to sit on except there was one old cushion that had the leaves of the date palms stuffed in it. You know, some worn out cushion. And the process and picked it up and threw it be behind Adi and said, sit down. And Adi felt embarrassed and he picked it up and he gave it back and he said, no, you sit down and I'll sit on the floor. And the process and then threw it back at him and Adi then gave it back and the Prophet some third time did it so Adi then sat down on the cushion and uh, then the Prophet sat down on the floor and again all of this is done to show honor and subhanAllah real honor is shown by the heart and not by the possessions Adi felt honored despite the fact that he's sitting on something he himself would not sit on back in his own house but he felt honored that his that the Prophet is giving him his own cushion and his own seat. And all of this again is done to open up the heart of Adi to Islam. Then the Prophet immediately jumped in. Ya Adi, what prevents you from saying La ilaha illallah? Do you know of any ilah other than Allah? Now of course Adi is a Christian. For him Allah is God. So he doesn't now obviously you can talk about his version of Christianity. But in the end of the day Christians are theoretically supposed to say there is no God but God. Theoretically, they're supposed to say that. Okay, God is God. So the Prophet asked him rhetorically, do you know any God besides Allah? Why don't you say the kalima? Adi is silent. The Prophet said, oh Adi, why don't you say 
Allahu Akbar. Do you know any that is Akbar than Allah? Why can't you say Allahu Akbar? And Adi is silent. And then the Prophet said, O oh, Adi, Aslim to Slim. Accept Islam, you will be safe. So again, the earnestness, the bluntness of accepting Islam. Accept Islam, you will be safe. Adi said, I am a person who has his own religion. I have my own deen. I don't need any other deen. So the Prophet repeated, Aslim to Slim. Accept Islam, you will be safe. And again, this is simple. We, uh, we mentioned this so many times. Aslim to Slim, and he's speaking to a Christian. The only way to have peace in this world and the next is through Islam. Aslim to Slim. You want Allah's salam, you want Allah's peace, you will need it through Islam. It won't happen if you are not a Muslim. The only religion acceptable to Allah is Islam. And he repeated this three times, and Adi keeps on saying, Inni rajulun ala deen. I have my religion. I have it. I don't need another religion. I'm happy in my religion. Then the Prophet said, and I found this very interesting, and to be honest, I did not know this phrase until today. Because only today I learned of this phrase and I did my research on it. Alasta rakusiyan. Aren't you a rakusi? And as I said, I did my research as much as I could. I could not with certainty verify the origin of rakusi. But this, this is found in the hadith literature. Are you not a rakusi? I have a theory and I could be wrong that this is an Arabicized of orthodox. And it could be incorrect. But they, even in Latin it was the orthodox. And this is amazing because the Prophet did not say, aren't you a Christian? He jumped to the specific type of Christianity that Adi was upon. Okay. Now, regardless of where the origin is, the Prophet did not say, aren't you a Christian? He jumped to the sect of Christianity that Adi was upon. And this is absolutely, to me, very, very phenomenal. And I have not found any other instance of something like this in the entire seerah. So the Prophet is well aware of the different sects of Christianity. And he's well aware which one Adi is upon. And aren't you an Orthodox? And Adi says, and do you know what a Rakusi is? You know an Orthodox? Then the Prophet said, Inni a'lamu bidinika minka. Subhanallah. I know your religion better than you. Subhanallah. What an amazing phrase. I know your religion better than you. Then he proved it. And he proved it in a way that Adi essentially embraced Islam. He said, Aren't you the leader of your people? Yes. And don't you take a fourth mirba' of your people's wealth in taxes? One fourth, by the way, 25% which is close to what we guys pay here in America, a little bit less than that. But mashallah, Adi was already in the Western system. huh? So don't you take a fourth of your people's wealth and taxes? Adi said, yes. And the Prophet said, and isn't that forbidden in your religion? Subhanallah. Isn't that haram in your own faith? In your own faith tradition, if you were to follow your sharia, you should not be taking taxes from your people. And Adi said, I humbled myself in front of him. Yeah, subhanallah. Just straight to the point. You call yourself a Christian. You call yourself orthodox. You think you're so high, but you're not following your own faith. So Adi says, I humbled myself. Which means lowering his head and he knows. And he said, and I knew he was a Nabi. Because he knew what nobody else would know. How, how does he know I have one fourth of my people? How does he know my religious text? How does he know? When my own people don't know this that well, this is something obscure. Again, most of the people are illiterate. Most of the people don't know. And the Prophet is telling him, don't you do this? How could you do this? And so he knew that he was a Nabi and he embraced Islam because of this. And subhanAllah, this is something that um, so many times uh, the Prophet does a minor miracle, if you like, for people to embrace Islam. So Adi lowers his head in shame and he doesn't know what to say because the Prophet has caught him. Then the Prophet said, Oh Adi, perhaps you are not wishing to embrace Islam because of the poverty that you see around me. Because the people are poor. The ladies come ask for money right now, this and that. Perhaps because of the poverty. If so, then by Allah a time will come when money will be distributed and no one will even want to take it. 
Oh, Adi, this is number one now. Perhaps you don't want to accept Islam because of poverty. Because now what's happened here? Pause here. What's happened here? SubhanAllah, it's so powerful. And this is the psychology of da'wah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first theologically proved Islam. Why do you not say La ilaha illallah? Do you have a problem with Allahu Akbar? Then he disproved his version of Christianity. You're not really following what you yourselves believe. Right? So, theologically prove the truth, disprove falsehood, but then there's still social issues that is bothering Adi. Because to embrace a faith isn't just theology. How many people, and I know such people, personally I know them, they will say, yeah, theologically Islam is true, but the Muslims are so backward, I can't, I can't embrace. Or the stigma attached. Or I'll have to give up this and that. Or, or, or. So Adi gets to the point of recognizing Islam is true, recognizing he's a hypocrite, he's not a real Christian, and he shouldn't pretend he is, right? But then there's still issues in his heart, and the Prophet lays it out. Because again, all of this is coming from Allah through Jibreel. The Jibreel is telling him what the issues are. So the Prophet is saying, perhaps you're not embracing Islam because you see the people poor. You're a rich man. Your father was a rich man. And you feel as if we are all poor here. By Allah, wallahi, a time will come. Money will be so much in this ummah. People will give and there will be nobody to receive. Nobody's going to want that money. Oh Adi, this is number one. Perhaps you are not wishing to embrace Islam because you see us surrounded by enemies. And you don't see us having army and wealth and prep, not wealth, army and uh, army and armor. Like idda and udda is like basically, um, how is to translate this? Like we don't have the material preparations for war basically, okay? We don't have material izza in this regard. If so, then by Allah a time will come when a lady will leave the city of Qadisiyah and come to the house of Allah, meaning the Kaaba, all by herself, fearing none but Allah. So the second reason, you seem to be politically weak, O Muslims. And if you guys were true, then why are you politically weak? If you are the Nabi, why are you politically weak? So perhaps you're not embracing Islam because you see us politically weak. A time will come when we shall be so strong that the lady will come from Qadisiyah all the way. Qadisiyah is in Iraq. Is in Iraq and Iran, Iraq now. And it will go all the way down to Mecca and it will be so safe, she will not be worried for her safety. We'll have that much power. Then number three, O oh Adi, perhaps you are not wishing to embrace Islam because you see the kingdoms are in the hands of others. Al-Mulk is in other people's hands. By Allah, a time will come when you shall conquer the lands of Kisra, of the Persian emperor. And you shall own the white palaces of Babel in Iraq. And you shall distribute the wealth of Kisra. And Adi, this was the most amazing of the three. He said, Kisra ibn Hurmuz, Kisra. Like you're talking about the Kisra. I'm going to have his wealth or we are going to have his wealth. And the Prophet said, yes, Kisra ibn Hurmuz. And this is, one can say, uh, civilization. Like we seem to be, we don't have power. So the first is basically wealth. The second is armies slash political. Third is also political, but also civilizational. Like we don't seem to have much here. Now this I found very intriguing because the impediments that Adi has, many in modern times have about Islam as well. As I said, I know such people. Being in my field of academia and whatnot, I meet such people all the time where they know Islam to be true, but they are troubled by other factors, not theology. They're troubled by the fact that the Muslim world seems backward. They're troubled by the fact that the GDP, whatever, is this and that, right? Or, I mean, nobody says this, but I'm saying the number of Nobel Prize winners in the Muslim lands is this and other lands. That. I mean, they have their reasons for doing this, okay? And this causes them to doubt. And subhanAllah, rather than being so harsh on them, think of the hadith of Adi. And he is not talking to me or you, he's talking to the Nabi Sallallahu himself. Can you imagine? He's not talking to me, he's talking to the actual Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet exposes his heart and says, you are in doubt because of our poverty. But see, here's the point. Some people 
some people can't help but judge the truth of a religion based on other factors. It's somewhat human nature. It's very few that can really see through all this and say, you know what, political power does not mean you're right. Civilization doesn't mean you're upon the haqq. Money doesn't mean you're a better person. It takes an extra strength of purity to get to that level. And there are many, alhamdulillah, who convert because of this, but there are many who don't. And here is Adi struggling to convert because of these three factors. And the Prophet ﷺ did not criticize him and say, why are you basing the truth on GDP? Why are you basing the truth of civilization? Because he knows, and we all know as well now at this point, that civilizations come and go and the time will come for the Ummah when it will be at the pinnacle. And Islam will demonstrate that it is capable of being a global force. But Allah Azza wa Jal, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَامُ دَاوِرُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ Allah gives and takes these things away. Truth shall be with Islam, but power will not always be with Islam. Truth shall be with Islam, but economic benefit will not, will not always be with Islam. That will come and go. So the Prophet is telling him, and therefore, if some da'is use this line as well, we should not criticize them. Sometimes many of us get more fundamentalist and fanatic than we need to be. And we simply dismiss these things as not being correct. And this is uh, extra fanaticism. If somebody points out the beauty of Islamic civilization, the heritage of the past, the technological achievements and whatnot, the glory that was, there's nothing wrong with that. And it is a sign of our civilization. And it is a sign of the great accomplishments that we did. And if we point out, and again, you've heard me speak, you can hear this a million times from other lectures as well, there's no question that in its time, Islam was the most glorious civilization in the world. There's no question that the Islamic empire in the late Umayyad and early Abbasid time was the largest empire humanity has ever seen, spanning the globe from Andalus all the way to China, Turkestan, the entire, you know, uh, uh, that, that entire strip of the world is ruled under one empire. This is the largest empire the world has ever seen. And the technological achievements, so we can go on and on. If somebody uses this for da'wah, alhamdulillah, here's the sunnah for us to do so. This is the precedent that the Prophet is showing this, that this is a part of Islam as well. And so Adi would later narrate this and he would say, Wallahi, I have seen two of the three and I have no doubt that the third is going to happen as well. The two of the three, what did he see? He himself said, I participated in the battle of Qadisiyah. I was of those who participated in the battle of Qadisiyah and we distributed the wealth of Kisra to the people like the Prophet said, the, 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 the palaces of Babel, we, we basically owned them. And I myself saw a lady leave from Qadisiyah on her way to Hajj all alone, fearing none other than Allah Azza wa Jal. And the third one, I have no doubt it will happen. The third one is when money will be distributed um, and no one will be there to take it. They say, and Allah knows best, this will happen in the time of the Mahdi. They say this will happen in the time of the Mahdi where uh, once in the final Armageddon, when that battle takes place and everything finishes up, so much wealth will be acquired and there will be so few people as well because everybody's dead after the Armageddon. So there will just be money, 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 and there won't be any need for it. People will, you know, like the Prophet said, a man will be offered a hundred gold coins and he's going to say, I have no need for it, take keep it. And that's an amazing amount of wealth. Even right now, if some of us will offer a hundred gold coins, I don't think anybody would say, yeah, you can keep it. <laughs> it's a very huge amount of money. But that's, that time will happen. Some have said that in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Abdul Aziz, this happened. Allah knows best. I don't think it, w poverty was not eliminated in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Allah knows best. But in any case, for sure, uh, the, the, the third of them is going to happen whenever it happens as the Prophet ﷺ predicted. So obviously with the Prophet ﷺ telling him these things, Adi embraced Islam. And Adi became a, a, a Muslim, returned to his land as a leader, returned to his people. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Anytime a leader converted, he got everything back. This is an enticement as well. Any leader who converted to Islam retained his status, his power, his dignity. So Adi goes back and becomes the leader of his people. And his iman became so strong that when uh, the news came of the death of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is a member up north. And if you remember, the wars of Ridda were all in that region. And it was in that region where all the fitan took place. 
and it was that region where Musaylama al kadhab and where Sajjah and where all of the people basically became Murtad in that region. The one land that did not become Murtad was the land of Tay. That was Ha'il. That's the one land that remained upon Islam in that entire region because of Adi ibn Hatim. When everybody left Islam, Adi remained firm and he commanded his people to remain firm. And so all of his people, the tribe of Tay, retained their Islam. And uh, Umar ibn Khattab later praised Adi for this and recognized his, his, uh, his, his achievements um, for this. And he then traveled to Medina after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. And as I just said, he participated in the wars of the conquest. And he was of those who fought the Persians. He fought in the Battle of Qadisiyah. And he was active in the leadership of the Muslim community in various capacities. Again, long list of specific things. But it's basically, he was obviously as a king in, in Jahiliyyah, as a chieftain in pre-Islam, he is a person person of, of, of political strength. He's a person who knows how to rule. So the Khulafa used him in various capacities until when the civil war took place, he sided very strongly with Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, and he became a staunch ally of Ali and he fought with Ali in both battles in Sifin and in Jamal as a commander, as a leader. And because of this, Adi ibn Hatim is beloved to the Shia as well because anybody who fought in the side of Ali, it becomes, so pause here, according to the Shia, the definition of a Sahabi, those who stood with Ali. That's who they define, not those who saw the process and those who stood with Ali, those who fought with Ali. So the Sahaba, in our definition, who stood with Ali becomes Sahaba for them. So they, when, when we say they don't respect the Sahaba, that's not technically true. It's just their definition of Sahaba is different. Who they define as Sahaba is different. So the ones who, Shia to Ali, the ones who supported Ali, become the Sahaba. And Adi ibn Hatim is one of them. As we said, Salman al-Farsi and others, the Ammar ibn Yasir, they all become Sahaba from their um, perspective. So Adi ibn Hatim is beloved to both uh, sects of Islam. And Ali radiallahu an placed him in charge of the major battalions in Sufin and in Jamal. So he had a huge stake in both of these um, battles. And of course, as we know, Ali was assassinated ta'ala an, and that seems to have um, basically caused um, uh, Adi to withdraw from public life. And we don't hear anything about him until his death in the year 67 Hijrah, more than 100 years old, uh, more than 100 years old. Uh, of course, Ali passed away or was killed 45, 46 AH. So for the next 22 years, there's not a single mention of Adi, which means he withdrew from public life. So after the death of Ali radiallahu an, Adi would have been basically his own. And the fact that he died also in Kufa. So he's living in Kufa where everything took place. So he basically retired and he stays in Kufa until his death. And they say that his burial is still known to this day in the city of Kufa. So uh, that's all that we know about Adi ibn Hatim. A very brief story. And yet I thought it to be very, very beautiful as well because of the lessons learned. We have one more story to do before we get there. Some of the ahadith of Adi ibn Hatim. Adi really does not have that many ahadith. Without repetition, there's around six or seven. Very few hadith without repetition. One of the things about Adi, by the way, is that he was a, uh, a well-known marksman, a huntsman. He would hunt and he was known, he was legendary for his hunting skills. So he has a number of hadith about hunting. We're only going to mention some of them. But uh, one of the things I'm doing in this series is we're trying to get a psychology of the Sahaba through the hadith they narrate as well. And if you see, that's what I'm doing every time we get a Sahabi, we narrate his hadith because you want to see, well, what is he interested in? Where is he getting from? So Adi ibn Hatim, we hear certain things and it's not a coincidence that we have some of the most important hadith about food uh, and hunting from Adi because he's asking the Prophet some specific questions. I'm not going to do all of them because we don't have time. We'll just do three or four uh, hadith from Adi uh, and then move on. Uh, and uh, again, Musa Imam Ahmad. So, وعن Adi ibn Hatim عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من حلف على يمين فرأى غيرها خيرا منها فليأتي بالذي هو خير Whoever swore by Allah an oath then changed his mind and thought that there is something better than his oath. Let him break the oath, give the kafara, and do what is better. Okay, so this is Islamic fiqh here, and it's something very important that if somebody makes a halaf in the name of Allah, it says, Wallahi, I'm not going to do this. 
and he gave a halaf. I'm not going to go to that person's house. Well, I'm not going to do this. He made, he made a genuine halaf and he thought it was for his best interest that he makes a halaf, an oath with Allah's name. Then he changes his mind, whatever the man did, he apologizes for whatever happened in the past is forgiven. So then the man feels, you know what, now I should not honor that. The Prophet is saying, don't feel guilty. If there's something better that can be done that would destroy your halaf, give the kafara. So feed 10 people or fast 10 days, give the kafara for the halaf. And then once you've given the kafara, you can then go and do the better thing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a simple hadith that uh, Adi uh, narrates. وعن عدي بن حاتم uh, he said that Ya Rasulullah we are a people who hunt or I'm a person who hunts and we hunt with the mi'rad we hunt with the mi'rad what is a mi'rad? I don't know if there's an English equivalent to it I looked this up in the definitions of the classical dictionary mi'rad is a hunting weapon which seems to be something like a, a throwing object one side of which is sharp and the other side is dull and when you throw it, you don't know what's going to hit the animal. Either the sharp side to cut it or the dull side to hit it. Okay, this is what it appears to be. Is it a type of axe? Maybe something like this. Okay, could be a type of axe that is just being flung at the animal. So he said, I hunt with the mi'rad. Is it allowed or not? So the Prophet ﷺ said, whatever is hit by its sharp edge or sword you may eat it but whatever was killed by the blunt side then it is haram meaning so the sharp when the sharp thing hits is going to cause blood and when the blunt side hits is going to be trauma it's just going to be a hit a pain like this that's not going to be so whatever is cutting or slicing in the hunt that is allowed and whatever is bluntly forcing death on the animal that is haram and this is something that is well known it's something all of the madai pretty much apply uh, that when it comes to hunting an animal the sharia gives a concession that concession is you don't have to slaughter via cutting its neck you may cause the blood to flow from any other organ but as long as the blood is flowing the blood must flow for the animal to be considered halal. This is only for uh, animals that are hunted, not for domesticated animals in your possession. So cows and chickens and sheep and goats and whatnot, it is wajib to do dhabah of them. You cannot slaughter a sheep by shooting it. This is haram and it is meta. It is meta if it's in your control. Now, I'm not going to give a long fiqhi class, but if it's in your control, it is haram. You cannot do it. But a deer, a gazelle, any other animal that you're hunting, if you somehow pierce the animal in a place that is not the neck and it's bleeding to death and it dies, it is halal. Now, if it doesn't die and you catch it still alive, you should try to do the dabah, yes, if you're going to be safe. But if you can't, as long as it's bleeding. So here's the hadith. Whatever is cut by its sharp side, eat. And whatever dies by the bluntness. So if uh, you catch an animal via um, the traps, for example. A'udhu billah, this is haram and it is filthy, it is meta, it is inhumane. If you kill an animal by blunt trauma, by hitting it, it is haram. Okay, and so this would be haram. Then he said, I asked him about hunting with dogs and falcons subhanallah so Ali is an expert he has hunting birds as well okay al-baz is the hunting falcon it's about the kalb and the baz the baz is the falcon so the prophet ﷺ said if you send your animal and you have mentioned the name of allah then eat فكل. and he said Whatever it catches for you and does not eat, then you may eat of it. And whatever it catches for itself and it has eaten, then you should not eat of it. Meaning what? If you train the dog or the falcon to hunt for you, then it's not going to eat of the meat itself. 
But if you find the animal eating of that meat, then it has not done it for you. It has done it for itself. So then you cannot. So by the way, that type of animal is not a trained. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا عَلَّنْتُ مِنَ الْجَوَارِحِ مُكَلِّبِينَ تُعَلِّمُونَهُنَّ مِمَّا عَلَّمَكُمُ اللَّهِ you have to hunt with trained dogs. This is in the Quran. A lot of Muslims don't know this. It's in the Quran. A lot of Muslims are clueless. It is halal to hunt with dogs. And what the dog catches is halal for you by the text of the Quran. But there are two conditions in the Quran. Trained and you mention the name of Allah. What is a trained dog? This hadith defines the trained dog. The trained dog is the dog that does not hunt except for you. And that's why the hadith says, if you find the dog eating, don't eat, because that's not a trained dog. That's not a trained dog. Okay. Then the hadith says, and if you find another dog with your dog, and you don't know which dog killed the animal, فَلَا تَأْكُلْ Then do not eat. فَإِنَّمَا ذَكَرْتَ اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى كَلْبِكَ وَلَمْ تُسَمِّي عَلَى الْكَلْبِ الْآخَرِ because you said the name of Allah over your dog when you sent it out and you did not say the name of Allah on the other dog. Okay? Now, Ibn Taymiyyah says, a little bit of fiqh, let me inject my position here. Ibn Taymiyyah says, this hadith is the most explicit evidence that the tasmiyah saying Bismillah is wajib for the meat to be halal. Because he linked the haramness of the meat over the tasmiyah issue, right? Because you said Bismillah over your dog and you did not say Bismillah over the other dog, okay? And when it comes to, uh, when it comes to hunting, the rules are lax. And when it comes to domestic slaughter, the rules are strict. Yet even in hunting, there is no laxity shown to what? To the saying of tasmiyah, Bismillah. So therefore, my position as you all know by now, that meat is only halal when Allah's name has been mentioned. Even if it's in Hebrew, kosher is halal. That's why kosher is halal. Because they mention the blessing of God before they sacrifice the animal. And if the name of Allah is not mentioned, then the meat is haram. This is my position. And I know the Shafi'is disagree and I have respect for the Shafi'i position, but I do not follow it because the evidences for it are very weak. My utmost respect to them, but these Ahadith Ibn Taymiyyah and others are very clear. The Hadith is so explicit in this regard. If you know that the name of Allah has not been mentioned, then it is haram to eat. It is mayta. It is something that فَلَا تَأْكُلْ Do not eat because you said Bismillah over your animal. You did not say Bismillah over the other animal. So he linked the haram to the lack of Bismillah. And the same applies to the meat around us here. In fact, not the same. Even more so in domesticated animals, in chicken and cow and beef and whatnot, we must therefore, in my opinion, and this is the Hanbali and Hanafi and Maliki position, and that is that you have to say Bismillah when you slaughter. And the Hadith of Adi is one of the main evidences. Even when it comes to hunting, you have to say Bismillah. When you release the arrow, when you shoot the gun, you say Bismillah. When you release your dog, you say Bismillah. Then the meat is halal. If you another dog kills, you didn't say Bismillah on that dog, then the meat is not halal. And that Hadith is the Hadith of Adi. So it's interesting to put um, over here. Uh, the other hadith of Adi, very simple one. Uh, Adi ibn Adim said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, there is none amongst you except that he shall speak to his Lord directly without any interpreter between them. Laysa bayna wa baynahu tarjuman. There's not going to be any interpreter. And he will look to his right hand side and he shall see nothing. And he will look to his front and he shall see nothing except what he has done. And he shall look to his left and he shall see nothing except that what he has done. And so whoever amongst you is able to protect himself from Jahannam, even with half a date, should do so. This is the hadith of Ali. It's famous. You hear it in khutbahs all the time. That on the day of judgment, there will come a time where you will be in front of Allah, I will be in front of Allah, there will be no one between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will look everywhere for help, and you will find nothing other than your deeds. So at that point in time, the Prophet said, you will want everything you have. Even if you have half a date you've given, you will be happy you gave it. So whoever is able to do that, let him do that. This is a beautiful and powerful hadith of Adi uh, ibn Hatim. Um, 
Ali, uh, Ali ibn Hatim uh, that he said that, O Messenger of Allah, uh, we are a group of people who hunt. And sometimes we do not find a knife to cut the animal with. So can we use something else? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Amirra damma bima shi'ta wadhkur ismallahi alayhi Cause the blood to flow however, whatever instrument you have. Let the blood flow with whatever instrument you have. And mention the name of Allah over it. So this hadith is another hadith that is used by the three madhahib to say that to, to make an animal halal, two main conditions must be met. The first one is the blood has to flow. So even if you don't have an, a, a, a knife, in those days, they were people, mashallah, they could do anything. They'll take a stone and they'll sharpen part of the stone. Imagine if you have a rabbit or something, okay? It's a small animal. You don't have a big knife for it. You can take a stone that has a sharp enough thing and you use that stone to cause the blood to flow on the jugular vein. That is good enough. Whatever causes the blood to flow and you mention the name of Allah on it. So these two conditions, once again, are um, mentioned in the hadith of in the hadith of uh, uh, Adi. Uh, the final hadith that we'll do is the hadith that mentions his conversion. I just wanted to tell you the smaller version directly from uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed. That hadith said that when I uh, Adi, Adi said, sorry, Adi said, when I heard of the Prophet sallallahu coming out, I hated him a severe hating, and I left until I went to one land of the uh, one area of the land of the Romans. And even I entered upon Qaisar himself. I visited the Caesar himself. But I began to hate my status in that land more than I hated the coming of Muhammad to my land. In other words, his place in Rome, his place in, in the Roman empires. And I began to say to myself, what if I came to this man and spoke to him, meaning Muhammad Sasa, if he's a liar, he's not going to harm me. And if he's telling the truth, then I'll learn something. So I came to him and the people began to say, Adi ibn Hatim, Adi ibn Hatim. And I entered upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this is a summarized version. I gave you a longer version obviously. And he said to me, Ya Adi, aslim tuslim. The same thing that I said three times. Adi said, Ya Rasulullah, inni ala deen. I already have a religion. So the Prophet said, Ana a'lamu bidinika minka. I know your religion better than you. And Adi says, Anta a'lamu bidini minni. You know my religion better than me. And the Prophet said, Naam, alasta min al rakusiya Aren't you from the Orthodox? Alasta min rakusiya And yet you eat one fourth of your people's money. I said, Yes, I do. He said, This is not allowed in your religion. Adi said, As soon as he said this, Fatawadu lahu, I humble myself in front of him. And then he went on to say, I know why you're not entering Islam uh, because the, the, the weaker people are following us who don't have any quwa. Uh, and then he mentioned the three things. I just want to move on here very quickly. So the point being, this is the, the, the story of Adi ibn Hatim. Uh, I know time is up, but the rest of the other story is so small and it, I think it's a very interesting story as well. Ten minutes and we're done. And the story of, of this Sahabi is very similar to Adi from their backgrounds. Both of these are Christian Arabs. And they're both chieftains of their people. And I thought I'm just going to combine their two stories. And this, this Sahabi has no hadith. So we don't have any hadith to mention. But his story is beautiful. And I love his story. And I mentioned it briefly in the seerah. Now we'll mention it a little bit longer. And that is Thumama ibn Uthal. Thumama ibn Uthal. So Adi ibn Hatim is from the tribe of Tay, which is in the land of Ha'il. Right next to Ha'il is the land of Yamama. Yamama these days is called Najd. Najd is Riyadh and whatnot, okay? Ha'il is a, a little bit north of that. So right next to the neighboring land is the land of Yamama. And the leader of that was also a Christian. And his name was Thumama ibn Uthal. Thumama ibn Uthal. And Thumama was not as famous as Adi ibn Hatim or anything like that. So we don't know much about him. But what is known about Thumama was that he was highly beloved to his own people from the tribe of the Yamama, the, the, the tribe of Yamama. And he 
was a person who was renowned in Arabia for his handsomeness. He was tall, broad shouldered. He would dress in the whitest of garments. He would act like a king. He would walk like a king. He would dress like a king. He acted very regally, very royally. And he was beloved to his people. In the beginning of the sixth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ sent an expedition towards the north and they brought back some prisoners of war. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at them and he had never seen Thumama before. And he said to his own Sahaba, he said, have you not recognized your prisoner? They said, who? He said, this is Thumama ibn Uthal, the leader of his people. The Prophet ﷺ recognized him because Allah told him. Because Jibreel recognized Thumama. Otherwise, so his own people had not told the Sahaba who Thumama was. They thought we can keep it on the, on the DL. On the, keep it on the, nobody's going to know who he is. But the Prophet ﷺ recognized Thumama. That this is Thumama, you caught the big guy. So it was an unexpected boost. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ahsinu ilayhi, treat him with utmost kindness and give him of your best food. And he commanded that his own food be given to Thumama and he commanded that his own she-camel be milked to give the milk to Thumama. Now again, the camel, uh, it's not going to be as if you know, that milk is any different than the other milks, but it is an honor for Thumama. That the Prophet is publicly saying, my camel shall be given you know, to him. My food that you're preparing, you give it to uh, Thumama. And he ordered that Thumama be taken away from the other prisoners and be in the, um, in the, in the masjid of the Prophet as a prisoner. So he was tied to one of the, 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 uh, the pillars. And to this day, there is a pillar in the Rawdah. They say that's the pillar of Thumama where he was tied. And so he was tied in the Rawdah for three days. Three days and three nights, he lived in the masjid, fed there, you know, taking care of there, whatever needs to be done. But he is living basically in the masjid. And every day, the Prophet some of the first thing in the morning after Fajr, he would pass by Thumama and he would say, Ya Thumama, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? And Thumama would always say the same thing for three days in a row. Ya Muhammad, in taqtul, taqtul dam. If you're going to kill me, you're going to kill somebody whose blood is heavy. I'm not an average person. You're going to kill me. My blood is heavy. Taqtul dadam. I'm a king. I'm a leader. And if you want money, you're asking somebody who can give. And if you forgive, wa in ta'fu. If you forgive, then you're going to forgive ala shakir. Somebody who will show you what is being generous. And subhanAllah, even look at his words. Like he's speaking like a king. He's not, he's li looking at death in the eye. He's like, if you're going to kill me, you're going to kill somebody who has blood. And if you want money, I'll give you what you want. And if you forgive, you forgive somebody who will show thankfulness. And subhanAllah, what a, what a sensible, calm, dignified man. Three options, I give them to you. You're going to kill me, what do you want me to do? I can't do anything. And if you want this, you want that. So, but, he, but of course, the process is not interested in any of these three. He wants Islam. And Tumama is not giving him that. So second day, same question, same response. Third day, same question, same response. Now, pause here. Up until this point, this is the sixth year of the Hijrah, there has not been any war between Thumama and the Muslims. So it's not as if the Prophet ﷺ has a reason to keep him or whatnot. Right now, Islam is expanding. This is the time of expansion. And so he wants to entice him to embrace Islam. Thumama is not taking the bait. So on the third day, the Prophet ﷺ said, let him go free. Atliqu. Khalas. No conditions, no nothing. Let him go free. So Thumama, the hadith says in Sahih Muslim, immediately went to the closest garden there was. There was shelter. And he took a ghusl and bath. And he returned straight to the masjid. And in front of, and so they thought he had left. In front of everybody, he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka la rasulullah. And then he said that famous phrase, which is why the story of Thumama is one of my favorite stories. He said, Ya Rasulullah, it's changed from Ya Muhammad yesterday, huh? Ya Rasulullah, you were the most despised person to me. And your face was the most hated face to me. And your religion was the worst religion to me. But today your face is the most beloved to me. And you are the most beloved person to me. And your religion is now my religion. SubhanAllah, just immediately, without one word of da'wah, 
But what happened in three days? What did Thumama see? The Muslims. That's all it was. This was da'wah. He just needs to see Islam. That's all he needed to do. Then, and, and so of course, yani, the, the Sahaba were happy. There's uh, the Prophet yani, uh, blessed him and whatnot. Then he said, Ya Rasulallah, your troops caught me when I was intending to do Umrah. This is why I didn't have my armed guard. I didn't have, it was a small entourage. It's a complete surprise. Your troops caught me, you know, your, your cavalry caught me when I intended to do Umrah. What do you think I should do now? So the Prophet said, go and do Umrah. Go, I'm not stopping you. Now, this is, I just used this incident two months ago here in this masjid when we talked about the issue of visiting Palestine under blockade. This is one of those evidences that's very clear. Thumama is not from Medina. And the Meccans had forbidden the Medinans, the Ansar and the Quraysh, from, the Muslims in Quraysh from coming. They hadn't forbidden any Muslim from up north. Up north, it was allowed for them to come to Mecca. Thumama is neutral politically right now, right? He is basically an American passport as a Muslim going to Israel and Palestine, basically, right? He has the political luxury to enter. He's not that. So he's asking Rasulullah, can I go? And the Prophet said, go to Mecca. I'm not stopping you, go. And so Thumama uh, goes for Umrah. And he entered Mecca. Again, he's the king of his people. He's the chieftain of his people. And he started saying the Talbiyah for the first time in history. So this is a tr trick uh, question, not a trick, a, qui a trivia question. Who was the first Sahabi to say the Talbiyah out loud in Mecca? It is Thumama ibn Uthal. Okay, the first Sahabi to say the Talbiyah out loud in Mecca is Thumama ibn Uthal. When, before the Fatih, right, two and a half years. When Thumama enters and he's saying the Talbiyah, and he's saying the Talbiyah, the Meccans surrounded him. Asabauta, atarakta dinaka, have you become a, again, Sabi is what they would say, have you become a Muslim, what not? And he goes, I have chosen the best religion on earth. He's proud of what he's done. But the Quraysh became so incensed, some of the younger amongst them manhandled him. They pulled him off of his camel. They surrounded the, the people there. And one person even drew his sword to kill him. So Thumama didn't think this would happen. But it happened. Riff raff, mob mentality, right? Until finally some of the seniors of the Quraysh said, Leave him. Have you lost your minds? If you kill him, we're going to be in serious war. Let him go back to his people. So the wiser minds prevailed, but Thumama, after he finished his tawaf and umrah, before he left, he said in his anger, Wallahi, I will not allow a single grain of barley to come to you until the Prophet himself sends me a letter saying that I can send you something. Why? Because Thumama is in Yamama, and Yamama is where all the caravans are coming up and down from. And he can block the caravans from doing anything. Even if it's going to be an economic loss to him, it's going to be an actual loss to the Quraysh. And so the first thing that he did when he got back to uh, his land of Najd, he prevented all the caravans. He purchased all the goods and he hoarded them himself, sent the caravans back up north. And the people of Mecca suffered one of the most severe, it wasn't even a drought, it was a lack of food until people began to starve to death because no barley is coming. All of their grain would come from up north and Thumama has shut off the door from any caravan coming with food to the people of Mecca. So much so that they wrote a letter to the Prophet Sallallahu I mentioned this in my seerah. They wrote a letter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, you are a man who commands people to be good to his relatives. How can you be commanding this when your own relatives are starving because we don't have any food. So they're accusing the process of basically show us some mercy or we're relatives, right? Please go tell Thumama to allow food to come down. So the Prophet wrote a letter to Thumama that you may send the food, let the caravans go to the people of Mecca. And that was when Thumama opened the um, door. And that's all that we know about Thumama. Again, he participated in the Battle of Muta and he died in the early Caliphate of Umar. That's all we know. But what an amazing story about Thumama ibn Uthal and one of the best 
points and with this we conclude inshallah ta'ala there are no hadith Umama doesn't have any hadith and we have no information about him other than the story of his conversion because he's not in Mecca he's not in Medina he's a chieftain who was a prisoner of war then he goes back to his tribe it is said he participated in one ghazwa but that's it after that then he passes away in early uh, Abu Bakr or early Umar sorry late Abu Bakr or early Umar one of the two but the one thing that we benefit from this and is very important is the sunnah of economic boycotts BDS BTS movements you know guys BDS what it is we can say that it is something the tactic is something that we can find from the Sunnah itself economic boycotting Thumama did it and the Prophet ﷺ did not mind until he had to himself say khalas okay give it to them in other words it's a tactic that is allowed to be used when it needs to be used and if it's something you don't want to use it, you don't have to use it as well. But the overall concept of economically boycott, Thumama at that time was not able to physically attack Mecca. The politics didn't allow it to happen. He couldn't do that. But there was another tactic that he could do. And that tactic was political, oh, sorry, economic pressure. And he did that economic pressure. And it worked to a certain extent. Why? Because by negotiating, the Prophet ﷺ then gained an upper hand over the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ negotiating for the Quraysh, it gives him an upper hand. And it was only then a matter of time before the conquest of Mecca takes place. So all of this is an interesting uh, um, uh, uh, tactic that we can say it is something that can be allowed from the seerah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.